Two years ago today, I uploaded my very first video here on YouTube, and in the over 700 days since then, I've uploaded a total of 99 scripted videos, be they reviews, or top 10s, or the PS Plus reviews, or first impressions, 99 videos in total. Today, on the second birthday of the Golden Bolt, and on its 100th episode, we're gonna go back to where we all began, as I re-review Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus in preparation for the Sly Cooper Marathon. Sly Cooper is the latest child born into a long line of master thieves. The Cooper clan was world-renowned for pulling some of history's greatest heists, mainly stealing from those who abused their wealth. Each Cooper journaled his or her skills into a book for future generations to learn from and improve upon, the Thievius Raccoonus. However, a couple millennia of stealing from high-profile thieves made the Cooper clan a target. I'm not sure how, because raccoons are adorable. I mean, look at that face. Could you really get mad at that face? They're so cute. Well, apparently a gang known as the Fiendish Five found a way, because they really hated the Coopers. Led by the mysterious gigantic owl Clockwork, this group broke into the Cooper house and stole the Thievius Raccoonus. Wait, how did they even get through the door? Clockwork's got a wingspan of like 50 feet. Well, however they did it, they killed Sly's parents once inside, leaving the young Cooper cowering in a closet. With no family left to care for him, Sly was sent to an orphanage where he met his best friends Bentley and Murray. Together, the trio began a long journey to reclaim the book and save the Cooper family's history. This is where Sly 1 begins. The gang starts off in Paris, where they're stealing Sly's case file from the office of Carmelita Fox, one of Interpol's finest. Once they've made off with the file, they find that the Fiendish Five split the book up amongst themselves and spread across the world. With that, the gang hunts down each member of the Fiendish Five, defeats them, retrieves their section of the Thievius Raccoonus, and gets out just before Carmelita crashes the joint. There's Raleigh, the genius frog engineer, Mugshot, the roided up mobster bulldog, Ms. Ruby, the voodoo savant alligator, the revenge-hungry demolitions expert known as the Panda King, and finally, Clockwork. What's interesting about these villains is that after stealing the book, they all went on their separate paths. There was no overarching goal at hand here except to kill off the Cooper lineage. I find that uniquely intriguing for a group of antagonists, especially for a kid's game. As we'll see going forward with this series, Sly's never afraid to get a little dark and a little real. Now before we continue, I want to give a quick spoiler warning here. I'm going to mention a few things regarding the ending of Sly 1, so skip ahead to this point in the video if you don't want to see that. Do keep in mind though that the Sly games tend to pick up directly after a previous game's spoilers, so in the next review I'm going to have to spoil Sly 1 anyway. Don't say I didn't warn you. After working their way across the world and through the first four members of the Fiendish Five, Sly and the gang find Clockwork's lair in Russia. Naturally, they head in, fighting past multiple security measures. That's no tower! That's no moon. It's a giant death ray! With Sly even saving a trapped Carmelita. The two form a temporary alliance to take Clockwork down once and for all. During the climactic final battle, Sly learns his foe's backstory. Clockwork at one point thousands of years ago was slighted by one of the Coopers, and has held a grudge against the clan ever since. He's gone as far as to replace his entire body with mechanical parts to become immortal, living entirely on his hatred. He founded the Fiendish Five in order to execute his master plan, stealing the Thievius Raccoonus to prove that he, not the Coopers, was the world's greatest thief. He even kept Sly alive to show that without the book, the Coopers were nothing. It's actually a brilliant plan, and it explains why the Fiendish Five split the book up in the first place. Of course, that's the only part of his brilliant plan, because after that he just kind of flaps around for a bit while Sly shoots at him. Didn't, um, you didn't think that went through all the way, did you buddy? He's probably still concussed from hitting his head on that doorframe all those years ago. Either way, Sly takes Clockwork down once and for all, at which point Carmelita ends their alliance, giving Sly a 10 second head start to escape. Five, four, three, two, The gang runs off with the now-completed Thievius Raccoonus, and that closes our adventure. I love the story in this game. Within each hub, almost every mission builds the plot more and more, talks up the villains, and makes the world feel more genuine. Sly lives up to his name, always being calm and collected in the field. Not to mention he's always especially suave around Carmelita. Bentley is neurotic and constantly warning Sly about possible dangers, but he always finds a way to help his buddy out with intel. Murray. 
well, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of how they treat Murray in this game. All he is is a big, stupid teddy bear, or hippo, I guess. Everything involving Murray shows that he's dumb and that his love for food gets him into trouble. He just feels flat in Sly 1, a characteristic I'm glad they fix in the sequels. That's really the only significant gripe I have here, though. Sly 1, like the rest of the series, feels like a thoughtfully executed plot that never particularly drags, jumping from episode to episode as if it was an actual cartoon. What's that? There's actually a cartoon now? Wow. Now that's what I call planning. Sly 1's story absolutely earns a golden bolt here. The way I often like to describe the first Sly game is that it's the logical next step in the Crash Bandicoot franchise, with added stealth mechanics. Similar to Crash, it's a level-based 3D platformer with relatively linear level design. Also like Crash, Sly has very limited health here and uses charms as extra hits. Some of the set pieces just come off in a very similar style too. Maybe it's just me, but the more I look at it, the more I see our raccoon hero as a PS2 update of everybody's favorite Bandicoot. Not everything is one-to-one, -one, of course. For example, in addition to the basic X to jump and square to attack that Crash and Sly both share, Triangle is used for special thief moves that Sly acquires throughout the game. Circle, meanwhile, is the do everything button. Seriously, if you're ever not sure how to do something in Sly, just jump and press the circle button, I promise. Additionally, whereas Crash always had a bit of weight to him, Sly is actually pretty floaty, in order to give both the players and the game a chance to breathe with those contextual circle button moves. This floatiness works in the game's favor, as Sly controls incredibly well. His motions are fluid, especially for a PS2 game. His attacks feel powerful, and despite risking the entire game on an action button, Sucker Punch made sure that the platforming rarely messes up on you. The big moment where Sly splits off from our orange buddy is, like I mentioned earlier, a focus on stealth. Sneaking around is always optional though, so advanced players can just cheese past most of the obstacles. These advanced players are even rewarded in the post-game when every level receives a time trial challenge. Sound familiar? However, even the most experienced players have got to be careful because one hit and you're dead. If you collect enough coins throughout the levels from breaking and killing things, you know, like any good thief, you'll obtain a lucky horseshoe to give you an extra hit, and it even stacks up for up to two freebie hits. Not that it really matters, lives are plentiful and there's no real punishment if you do game over. Even if you die on a level more than two or three times, the game pities you with a gimme horseshoe. On paper, this all sounds simple, and maybe even a bit weak. This might have cut it on the PS1, but we're in the next generation now. Things need to be bigger and better. Well, thankfully, Sly 1 thrives on its level design. Missions are incredibly varied and always add something new to the formula. Be it a level where you sneak by guards in a barrel to one of the many showdowns with Carmelita. Without interesting levels and set pieces to challenge the player, the formula of Sly Cooper would have fallen apart immediately. Thankfully, Sucker Punch realized this and they iterate constantly. Moreover, to add even more depth to the experience, in every level there are a set number of hidden clue bottles. Collect all of them and you get a code for that level's safe, which holds a page of the Thievius Raccoonus. The power-ups on these pages are entirely supplementary, such as a dive roll or this mid-air slow motion power-up. Later on, there are some really useful ones, such as total invisibility, but they're really just cool incentives to search each level. Like I said, this game absolutely shines as a platformer. The key problem with Sly 1 is that it doesn't want to be a platformer a lot of the time. Of the 40 levels in the game, about a third are non-Sly levels. Those levels consist of either Murray racing in the car because he's hungry, Murray being defended by Sly as he runs towards a key, or some other random mission like killing crabs to defend your treasure? These missions as a whole just suck. There's no genuine difficulty to these missions either. It's mostly about brute memorization of the level layout, spending a few tries getting a grip on controls that are about as tight as a broken rubber band, or just plain luck. It's a shame because these missions kill Sly 1's pace. Raleigh Stage is a fantastic tutorial for the game, teaching the player mechanics consistently from level to level. From World 2 onward, two or three of the stage's seven missions are gimmicks. Pretty much the entire final world is just one gimmick mission after another, and even Ms. Ruby's boss fight in World 3 is just friggin' DDR, except the timing on the button presses is slightly off. Now, to give credit where it's due, sometimes there is a funny reason for these filler missions. Such as this one, where we have to hack into Clockwork's Death Ray. 
we have to run over exactly 60 fallen computers in order to hack into the system. But these lava slugs here like to eat computers too, so we have to race them. Why do we have to race, you might be asking? Are there only 119 computers? Yes. Hurry! There are only 119 computers up there! When the game does something right, man does it do it right. There are levels that get my blood pumping, levels that make me feel like I, myself, am a master thief. And then there are levels that make me wonder what I'm doing with my time. Now given, it's not like I'm wasting a ton of time on Sly 1 because the game can be beaten pretty easily in an afternoon or less. This adventure lives and dies on the Sly sections. It didn't want to commit to being just a platformer, even though it would have been a fantastic platformer. Instead, it's just a good platformer. One that's held back by the developer's desire for variety. Because the gameplay could have, and arguably should have, been so much more with so much less, I'm gonna give the gameplay for Sly 1 a bronze bolt. While the game often falters on its substance, it makes up for that with loads of style. Upon starting Sly 1, we're treated to a cutscene of our main character preparing to break into Carmelita's office. The game actually overlays the main menu on top of real-time footage of Sly trotting around on the Interpol Station's roof. If you're starting a new file, you'll jump into the action right here. They ham it up right away, too, showing opening credits on the screen to highlight the stars of the game as you proceed through this intro. Again, Sly has always had that Saturday morning cartoon vibe to it. Like a weekend cartoon, the voice acting can get a bit rough at times. For example, Carmelita isn't exactly a show-stopping performance. I can promise you're gonna hear that one again before this marathon's through. Overall, it's fairly solid, especially for 2002. In particular, Kevin Miller's delivery as Sly is always a highlight in my eyes. He's honestly the heart of the series for me. There's good humor in the dialogue too, and the game never takes itself too seriously. Yeah, I might hate the janky vehicle controls, but Murray accidentally winning a race because he saw a food stand nearby? That's funny enough for me to give it a pass sometimes. Visually, the game is a beauty. Each chapter is bookended with comic-style cutscenes that give some backstory on the boss and forward the plot. Sucker Punch does a superb job of building the world in a short time with just these scenes. When it comes to the in-game models, the animation is always fluid and hitting enemies has the most satisfying thump to it. Sly always feels like a thief too, with his low center of gravity and the lightness of his movement. Levels rarely seem to repeat themselves visually too, even the ones that appear in the same overworld. Everything is always clearly laid out, and the world looks bright even though the colors themselves are dark. You might run into a couple graphical quirks here or there, but they never take away from the experience. Whether you play it on PS2 or PS3, it's genuinely a looker. Completing the package, it sounds great too. When Sly sneaks up behind an enemy, a little Tom and Jerry sort of bass flourish plays to match his footsteps. Most tracks have a jazzy groove to them to make you feel like a thief, while also making you feel vulnerable as a young, inexperienced thief. Take Prowling the Grounds, for example. It's one of the first tracks you hear, and it sets the tone so well. The track hides several layers behind the groove, trying to make the player feel nervous and weak at any given point. Deep in the background, there's constantly white noise playing to simulate the rain from Raleigh's weather machine. The frequent drip, drip, drip of raindrops keeps the player wondering if that sound might just be somebody turning around to discover them. Foliage seems to crackle as if there's something waiting to strike. It is so impressive to me that such a wonderful atmosphere is built up here in the first world without a single word. All of this atmosphere comes with a trade-off though, and that's that the soundtrack is mostly a complementary piece to the gameplay and thus doesn't stand out too much on its own. The levels in Mugshot's Mesa City Casino make you feel like you're gambling, and you get genuinely uneasy when trekking through Hades Swamp because of the deep, booming undertones. But it's hard to throw too many of these tracks on without context and enjoy them by themselves. That said, this is certainly the kind of game where the soundtrack could very easily blend together under a lesser composer, but each area sounds unique, and that helps each area feel unique. That's really all you can ask for with this kind of soundtrack. I think the coolest thing in terms of presentation, though, comes after you do everything else. In an addition almost entirely unique to this game, after 100%ing Sly 1, each level has a developer commentary that you can optionally play. 
In these, members of the development team discussed design choices for the level, things that were cut during development of said level, or even something entirely different. This feature is incredibly cool and adds to the experience for those that want to know every little secret about the game. Sly 1 has just about everything you could want out of a game as far as presentation goes. I do wish the soundtrack was a tad bit more memorable at times, but I can give that a pass. What I can't give a pass to is the often subpar delivery from certain characters in the game, such as Carmelita or even Clockwork for that matter. In a game with such strong character interaction, that just comes off as jarring, and that's enough for me to drop the game down to a silver bolt for its presentation. Cohesion? What the f*** is that? There's a reason Sly Cooper was the first game I reviewed here on YouTube. It's a game I truly love, but one that has some clear flaws that I can't ignore from a critical perspective. I wanted to use this game as an example to show everybody watching that nothing is safe, even the games that I hold nearest and dearest to my heart. With that said, we're going to move right along with this Sly Marathon onto a game that I haven't covered yet, and that is Sly 2 Band of Thieves, so make sure you subscribe if you want to see that. As always, thank you very much for watching. Whether it's your first video or your 100th video, I genuinely appreciate having you along for the ride. And that ride's only going to get a lot better from here. As always, everybody, stay golden.